So this talk is going to be about communication using reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. And I will focus a little bit on the fundamentals just so that everyone knows what this is going to be about if you haven't seen the previous presentation. And then I will focus on some recent insights about when these ones can potentially be useful for communications. And I'm Eamon Björnsson. Uh, I'm a visiting professor at KTH in Stockholm and otherwise I'm an associate professor at Linköping University also in Sweden. Imagine a world that is full of mirrors like this uh, room here in Versailles in Paris where you have mirrors all around you and I'm standing here with my iPad and suppose that some of these mirrors are not just reflecting light in the regular way that we are used to but some of them are special surfaces that are taking the signal, a wireless signal that comes from somewhere and then they are reaching this point here and then they are not reflected in the way that we're used to but they are beam formed in a controllable manner towards me as a user. Well then this will be an example of what a reconfigurable intelligent surface could do. So in this presentation I will refer to this as RIS so it stands for reconfigurable, which means that we could change the properties. Intelligent, in the sense that we can real-time control it, based on information that we can measure, some cognition. And surface means that it's essentially a two-dimensional array here of uh, controllable elements. So um, I will call this RIS, uh, or reconfigurable intelligent surface, throughout this presentation. So to understand really what this is uh, as compared to like old school technologies, uh, I think it's important to start with historical perspective and talk about passive repeaters. So this is uh, such a simple technology that you might not think about it is actually very useful. So suppose that you on the countryside are putting up base stations and you would like to cover a large area, but you also have the problem that some of your users are located in a valley here from which the signal cannot directly reach here. So these are so-called shadowed users. Well, then a passive repeater is nothing but a, just a billboard or the uh, regular type of advertisement type of billboard that you put up here. And you make sure that you can see the uh, base station. So you have a line of sight path, and then you're directing in such a way that the signal are going to be uh, reflected or scattered as a beam down in this valley. And this way we are providing coverage, which we wouldn't have had in this valley otherwise. This is an old school technology. It's fully passive, so you just put up here. Uh, you don't need to have any power supply or anything. It's just like a uh, advertisement billboard. The problem with this is uh, that you sort of need to use this surface to cover the entire region or entire valley here. So when you select the size of it, well, that the larger it is, the more energy it captures, but then it sort of needs to. Uh, focus it to cover the entire region, entire valley, even if uh, you only serve one of the users at the same time. So you sort of have this kind of trade-off between would I like to have a wide beam or a narrower beam? And if it's narrower, you cover a smaller region, you get more energy there. If it's wider, you cover a large area, but you get uh, less improvements from doing stuff like this. A reconfigurable intelligent surface could in its simple form be an improvement on this, something like this. So you have the same scenario, you have the same two users here in the valley, but if you replace this passive repeater with the reconfigurable intelligent surface, well then you could serve the blue user here with one beam that is more narrow directed towards that user, this purple user with another beam, and you can take turns, so try to send both of them at the same time. So that the benefit of this is that you can get a stronger beam towards the desired locations. So a bit more like beam forming where you know where the users are and you direct the signals there. On the other hand, the downside is that we need to control it somehow. So we need to uh, have the means of controlling it and we need to have the cognition so we can learn about how we should control it. So both of these two aspects becomes important. And now we need to have some kind of power consumption at this place as well. So this is historical, what the pass repeater is, and this is a reconfigurable intelligent surface. So in a nutshell, how would you implement something like that? Well, say that you have your base station transmitter here, you have your surface here, it's divided into small elements. And 
these elements are configured and controlled somehow so that the part of the time can send the beam towards this user, part of the time can send the beam towards this user, and in, potentially you can do both at the same time if you really want to. Well, in this surface, there are small elements. They are uh, containing a passive patch. So it's a simple type of antenna, for example. Uh, the exact details is not the important thing, but the general concept. This is a passive small antenna element that uh, is sub lambda size because the intention is that the element itself shouldn't have a strong directivity. Uh, it should try to scatter the signal as much in all directions as possible. And then you can control this element, uh, for example, with the switch or died, uh, so that uh, we can change its properties. And it can, for example, be to tune impedances that is determining uh, what happens, what kind of phase shift or phase delay that each element is providing. You can tune length of the lace line, you can have phase shift, or so many ways of, of um, uh, controlling type of things. But the, the important thing is that the elements can be controlled to have a different uh, type of phase delay. So that is what these different colors are indicating that uh, if the signal comes in here and we delay it in a particular way, well, then we can create constructive interference in a particular direction. And we'll come back to, to these type of things soon. But uh, before we go into more details on what we can use a reconfigurable intelligent surface for, I would like to put this type of technology into the more general taxonomy of cooperative communication, which is a field that was very popular 10, 15 years ago in general. And there, the sort of the idea is that you have a source that is communicating with destination. We can call it transmitter or receiver if you like to. And then we have an entity here that we put up, something that we put up there to help us control the radio environment to uh, cooperatively improve the signals. So this is something that is neither at the transmitter or at the receiver, but is something in between that helps us. And in this field, there's a number of different types of technologies and RS is one of them. So let me explain this taxonomy. There are two categories uh, here uh, vertically. Regenerative, these are technologies that are receiving the signal, process it, and then retransmit it later. So you need to sort of have some kind of baseband processing there. And then you have transparent. These are, are technologies that is uh, just quickly processing the signal in the analog domain uh, and then retransmits it. Then you have half duplex and full duplex mode. So half duplex means that this type of technology can first receive and then retransmit. While full duplex means that we can retransmit uh, or transmit at the same time. So they can both transmit and receive at this location. And let's now put in uh, different technologies here. On the first row, we have sort of classical things, relays or repeater. So an amplifying forward relay is sort of the old school analog repeaters that have a 100 years history. And it's also something that can be used in cellular networks of today. So if you are having bad coverage in your home, you can call up your operator and ask them, could you or can I get the permission to put up a repeater? to improve the coverage in my home. Well, then that is something that's actually possible to do. And also, I think it's that at least in 3G and 4G and 5G now are all supporting uh, things like decode and forward relays, which are more advanced technologies where you transmit a signal to another point, you process it in the baseband, re uh, you decode the, the data, and then you encode it again and retransmit it again towards the destination. The more emerging technologies is a regenerative full duplex. Uh, then you have relays that can actually transmit and receive at the same time. This is really uh, some of the, uh, the cool new things that are, are being experimentally built. And the RS is appearing here in this taxonomy as a transparent type of thing because it, it, it's something that doesn't have to regenerate the signal. The signal reaches the surface and then it's scattered again uh, with a certain directivity. I put it together here with a passive repeater. So this is where all of these different technologies are fitting in and they're sort of all used for the same type of purpose of improving the propagation environment somehow. And I think it's important to notice that these technologies, all of them have their good use cases. Uh, different choices will be ideal in different situations. 
And going forward with this RS technology, I think it's important to understand what are the good use cases for that particular technology. So that is what I will focus on in this talk. So just to understand how this surface is working, uh, as I said, the, the, L, uh, the RIS here contains many elements, and these are these squares that I have marked here. So what is happening is the transmitter is sending out the signal. It propagates over a normal type of communication channel to one of the elements. Then within the element, there is a controllable phase delay, and potentially you can also control the amplitude. And then after this particular delay, you are retransmitting the signal. It's the same signal that's just bouncing off the surface essentially. And then it's propagating over a new channel towards the receiver. And this happens for all of these elements here simultaneously. So the received signal at this receiver is going to be a summation over the signals that are scattered from all these, say, capital N different elements. So this summation. And you sum up the signals that comes via each of the different elements. And then you add noise. And it is here that you can control the properties of the signal that comes from each of these particular elements. And what can we control? Well, in particular, we can control the delay. So we can adapt it to the channel. And why is that of interest? Well, you know, when people are doing beamforming, then we are uh, sending out the same signal from multiple radiating elements and we are phase shifting them in such a way that we get constructive interference in certain places and destructive interference in other places. And we are particularly caring about to get constructive interference to add up in phase at the location of interest. So if we tune it uh, properly and we have our RIS here, then here we have the receiver and we make sure that the signal is sort of going to be focused towards this direction. And if the user is moving somewhere else, well, then we can retune the phase shifts, so we're forming a beam that is reflected in another direction. And sort of the important difference, however, from how beam forming is normally done, in, uh, is that the signal is not originally coming from the surface, but it comes from here. So there is one delay of the signal coming to different elements from the transmitter, then we are controlling an additional delay, and then there is yet another delay to the receiver. So it's these three components that we can optimize. But there is a lot of literature on how you can control this in, in theory. So just to try to explain how you should in your mind picture this. You can picture it as a surface that have one physical shape, but it can synthesize the shape of another object when it comes to how they reflect or scatter wireless signals. So if you have a signal, coming here uh, horizontally, and then you have a surface here. It's just a flat surface. Uh, 45 degrees is the uh, incident angle here, and then it's going to, according to Snell's law, leaves with 45 degrees, but in the opposite direction. Then this is sort of the normal type of reflection of signals. What you can do essentially with a reconfigurable intelligent surface is what we call anomalous reflection, which means that uh, we are making sure that we are getting similar type of reflection, but in the other direction, not if it goes in with 45 degrees, it doesn't go out with 45 degrees. And how do we do that? Well, progressively over the surface here, we are adding different delays in order to achieve that. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that by adding these additional delays within the surface, we are taking our surface and we are trying to make it behave as if the surface had this shape instead. So the signal is sort of propagating into the material, so to say, and delayed so that it, when it leaves, it's going to be uh, having constructive interference in this particular direction. And just as any other reflection, that means that you focus the signal in a particular direction at a point that is infinitely far away. And by tuning the phase delays profile over the surface, we can decide on what the direction is going to be. But there's more that we can do. We can also do sort of signal focusing at points that are closer away than infinity. And typically, our users that we serve in the wireless network are not infinitely far away. So in, in that case, it's not like we are going to have this type of linear uh, changes here in the phase delays, but we can have something else. So we are essentially approximating a bended or parabolic surface. And in that way, we can take the signal that comes in and then we can focus it at a particular point where the user is, for example. 
So these are examples of what you can utilize DeepVisys for doing. So more going into communication then, what would we actually like to use it for? The first use case might be to try to improve the signal to noise ratio in our system. So suppose we have a transmitter and it could reach the receiver immediately, but there is a big blocking object here. So the signal have to propagate through that one, lose a lot of its signal strength, and therefore we are looking for a better type of propagation paths. And we know that we can go around this object by putting up a surface here. I will compare having either a reconfigurable intelligent surface or this type of decode and forward relay at this location and see what happens. And I will not go into all of the mathematical or details or, or even uh, all of the parameter values. You can find them in a recent paper by us. But here is what I am showing. The end-to-end sync-to-noise ratio. Uh, what is the SNR that you get at the receiver side when you're transmitting? When we are having uh, different types of relays, we have either decode and forward relay. This is the dashed curve or we have a reconfigurable intelligent surface. That is the, the blue curve here. Uh, what you can see is that we are changing the surface size. We assume that the array is a square and it is growing or becoming smaller. So it grows as we move along the horizontal axis here. And the RS curve is below here. What does it mean? Well, it means, for example, if we compare a single antenna, the Kona forward relay, with a RS that should provide us with the same SNR, then there is a large difference in size. So the RS need to be much larger. In this case, it needs to be one by one meter large, which is fairly large when it comes to a type of equipment that we are using in RF, but for a mirror, it's not necessarily particularly large. And um, uh, that's sort of telling us that what this is that is specific with the RS. Well, it takes signal that's reaching it, it's phase shifting it without amplifying it, and then it's, it's uh, uh, sending it away in another direction. So we are sort of trading away the benefit of being able to amplify signals as a decode and forward relay is going to do, and the price to pay is that it needs to be larger. Then we should remember that decode and forward relay have the downside that it first receiving and then it retransmits. So if we are taking that into account, uh, then we should rather compare these two points here, where we don't need really the same SNR to get the same rate uh, because the RS is uh, a transparent relay, a full duplex, so it's a signal goes directly. There is no two-phase protocol here. But it's still that we need a fairly large surface to achieve the same rate here. So large surfaces are needed to beat an elementary decode and forward relay. And with that, I want to say that I don't think that we should focus on using this technology only to maximize the SNR. We should do something better than that, something that we can't do with a relay of the conventional type. And here is an example of that, that I believe a lot in. So say we really would like to improve some kind of channel properties that goes beyond SNR. And as you might know, essentially all transmitters in uh, cellular networks today have multiple antennas. So say that we have two antennas here, and then essentially all receiver, even your mobile phone, have multiple antennas that they are receiving. So say that we have multiple receive antennas here, then we have two transmit antennas, two receive antennas, and you have your RAS here with N elements. The problem with the setup like this is that we are assuming line of sight propagation here. So we are seeing each other, uh, and uh, that means that even if you have two antennas, the channel that they will observe is essentially the same if you are far away because the angle of difference is very small. So you have a uh, two-dimensional sort of ideal channel, but the rank of the actual channel is only going to be one. What we now can use the RS for is two potential different things, and that's what I'm going to show you here. Here is what I'm getting as my rate in bits per second per hertz as I'm changing the number of elements. And the black curve here is without an RS. It's a constant value. Then there are two modes of operation that I'm considering. One of them is that I try to maximize the sync to noise ratio. So I try to let the RS create a path that is adding up constructively with the path from the uh, transmitter here. In that case, we get the blue curve. And you see that we need to have fairly many elements even before we are seeing any benefits of even having the RS. But if we do something different, 
If we instead are uh, trying to improve the SNR, we try to make sure that the RS is creating a new propagation path, something that the receiver uh, can separate from the direct path using its two antennas. Well, then we can do something entirely different. We increase the rank of the channel to two, and we see that we much more quickly get a huge improvement of performance. We can, here we are, are doubling the rate, for example. So I believe that these are the type of improvements that we really are after. Conventional technology can probably beat also give comparable performance when it comes to maximized SNR, but improving the rank in a controllable manner, uh, that is something that is unique to this type of technology. So improved propagation conditions beyond SNR gains is what you should use this for. We should remember that in order to reconfigure a surface like this, we need to know how to reconfigure it. And the RS itself is sort of blind. It doesn't know how to uh, configure itself because it's not radiating a signal, it's not re receiving any signal, it's just scattering the signals in a controllable manner. So it can't observe anything. We need to guide it. And here is a recent way of sort of describing most of the algorithms that are being used to do that. The user device can transmit a signal over and over again towards the RS, and then the RS is trying different ways of configuring itself so that it is sending the signal towards the receiver here. And the receiver is observing these different beams and it's figuring out which ones that works the best. And now it needs to solve an optimization problem because it's typically not only to select one of these beams here, but it might be a linear combination of them that you would like to utilize. And if you have a direct path as well, uh, then you need to solve an optimization problem. And if you want to maximize the, uh, the rank, for example, uh, as I was describing on the previous slide, there is some kind of optimization that is done here. And that can't even be done at the RS, even if it would have had cognition properties itself. Then the base station here needs to feedback the preferred configuration to the RS, and then it is selecting how it should operate during that communication. And then something that we need to repeat as the user is moving or another user is entering, you would like to serve that user instead. And I used to believe that this is something that would be rather complicated to actually build. And therefore I was rather impressed when I recently saw a video here from the University of Surrey, where they are showing how you could implement something like this in a real system. This is a YouTube video that you can see as well. So I will just give one more example before I wrap up. Uh, and that is that this reconfigurability is something that where machine learning can be very helpful. Because when you have a large surface with many elements, there are many, many di dimensions to explore. So if you have a certain surface area, if you multiply that with pi and divide with the uh, wavelength lambda squared, you will get the number of dimension there is to explore. So if you have a half a meter times half a meter of three hertz band, you have 79 dimensions to, to explore. So you will have to send a lot of pilots try out 79 different reconfigurations. It will take a lot of time and it might even be hard to model the hardware properties uh, in this RS because you're going to have mutual coupling and other electromagnetic effects that is normally ignored by communication engineers. But here's a, a example when we have a transmitter sending a signal into a room. Users can be anywhere in this room and we will, are putting up this RS here in order to improve the performance inside this room and there is a path going in here. What I'm showing here is that uh, what spectral efficiency do we get at random location in the room? So these uh, curves here are for different random locations, say CDF curve. If we are just randomly selecting the phase shift here, we get this curve. If we are sending pilots in a conventional way, and then based on those pilots, we are, are selecting phases according to the best type of methods, we get the blue curve here. And if we train a neural network to do the whole thing at once, we get the black curve here. And if we know the channels perfectly and we do a perfect uh, phase selection, we get the red curve here. So what this is showing is that for users um, that are at the worst locations, uh, we are getting large improvement by sort of learning something here. And what is it that we're learning? Well, we are learning the propagation environment here so we can utilize that in order to improve our channel estimation. And since the surface is going to be here all the time, we can improve something so that it's uh, uh, going to be very useful all the time when we are in this room. Finally, just one more thing. Um, so I was mentioning these two different things. You can either focus a signal in a direction or at a point. 
And here is to illustration that if you have a small surface, it will sort of scatter the signal in some kind of directivity, but it still would be some kind of scattering. If you have a large surface, you will focus the signal much more narrowly. And say that you have a, a I'm varying the array width here from a small number to the left to a large number to the right. Then I'm showing the blue curve and the black curve. Uh, these are if I'm trying to focus on the location of the user, that is a blue curve or in the direction of the user that is the black curve. And when you are and having a small surface, it makes no difference. We can picture it as if we are focusing in a particular direction. But as soon as we are having a large surface, we are essentially in the near field uh, of the surface, then the blue curve is much better. We are getting much better path loss if we are focusing on the point of the receiver. While if you are trying to focus in the direction, you are essentially going to converge to a limit, which is sort of what an ideal mirror is going to be. Uh, and you see that in reality as well, when you look yourself in the mirror, you only see yourself in part of the mirror. So it's only part of it that is useful for you. Uh, so even if I and talked about anomalous reflection is that not what you ever want to do in the communication setup because you're either too small so you can't uh, do it or when it's large you want to focus on the point instead. So as a summary, RS is a new type of relay. It's not that good at beating other relays in terms of sync to noise ratio but it's well suited to improve other types of properties such as the rank of a MIMO channel that was about showing. I believe also that you can improve macro diversity. Uh, the good thing with having a large surface instead of a small relay is that you might not have the same shadowing towards all parts of it. And another thing that I didn't mention is that the surface like this can change the polarization of the signal and that can be very helpful to deal with polarization losses and uh, we need to explore new things in the future that you can improve as well. And concluding words uh, about RS, I think it's an excellent opportunity for PhD students to explore this field. Uh, to learn if you are in the electromagnetic area to learn a bit of communication and if you're in the communication area to learn a bit of electromagnetics. And I think it's particularly above 100 gigahertz where you will benefit a lot from adding paths, giving diversity and where you are expecting the users to be at low mobility so we have actually the time to reconfigure something like this. So that's all for me. You can hear me talk more about these type of things in my podcast, Wireless Future, and look in my YouTube channel.